Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. It's a joy and an honor to be here sharing a word of encouragement from the Lord with you this morning. I was used to being up here behind the mic singing, so it's a little different talking. I think I'd prefer to sing, actually, <laughs> but that's okay. I just want to give a shout out to my mother-in-law who's here this morning, and my mom will be watching online later as it is currently 1.30 a.m. tomorrow morning in Australia where she is. She's asleep. So I uh, love you, Mom. <laughs> Thank you for your love and your devotion, Mom and mother-in-law, um, in, in my life. It makes a huge difference, and it's been a great example to me. So, um, yes, my husband and I, Josiah there, um, we have five children, age 10, down through two, and I'm so grateful that the Lord called me to be a mother. It has been a refining process that I needed. <laughs> I thought I was a pretty calm person, you know, chill, relaxed, patient. It just turns out I had a really nice husband, because <laughs> when the children come along, whoo, they push your buttons in a way that no one else can, and I discovered some things in me I didn't know were there. So the Lord is working on me. Praise God. Uh, I want to open with a prayer of blessing for all the moms. The Lord put this strongly on my heart, so will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for bringing us all together here this morning. I thank you that you meet us at our point of need, wherever that is for each of us individually. I thank you that you are going to speak to each of us through some part of this service. Lord, I want to lift up to you women who have been unable to conceive or carry pregnancy. Lord, you know the pain and the heartache that that causes. But Lord, it is your perfect design that we were to be fruitful and multiply. Lord, I boldly come to you and ask that you would open wombs and heal wombs this morning. Lord, 1 John 5 says that I can have confidence if I ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And Lord, because you laid this so heavily on my heart, I believe that it is your will that I speak healing over these women this morning. Holy Spirit, come and empower these women. Empower them with life to your glory. Lord, I pray for mothers or children that are grieving today. This can be a very difficult day. Holy Spirit, I ask for your healing presence to comfort, to bring peace and hope. Psalm 56 reminds us that you keep track of all our sorrows. You have collected all of our tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And your hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or your ear dull that it cannot hear. I thank you that you hear the cry of our hearts. And Lord, I pray for those who are struggling in their role as mother. I pray for a renewed hope and vision. I thank you that you daily carry our burdens. We do not have to do this on our own. You give power to the faint, and to those who have no might, you increase strength. Lord, remind us all, every mother and everyone that acts in that capacity as mother, that in due season, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. So moms, I finish with this verse from Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The title of my message this morning is, What Does the Lord See When He Looks at Me? I think we can all agree that motherhood is pretty tough. It's extremely rewarding, but I would say in my own life, that has been the hardest thing I've ever done. Something that makes it difficult is that we find it so easy to look down on ourselves. We see every flaw. We see every weakness. We see every mistake we've ever made, and it feels like it's a permanent scar on our children. Um, but it's really important that we learn to see ourselves as God sees us. And we're going to unpack that this morning. Will you turn with me to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4? Then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at, angel, at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. 
Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the others standing there, take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Joshua, he said, see, I have taken away your sins, and now I am giving you these fine new clothes. In our text this morning, we have three, uh, sorry, two key characters, the adversary and the advocate. And we're going to unpack three different traits that each of these characters has and how it dictates how they see us. Number one, the adversary accuses. Very clear from our text today. The Hebrew word, as I discovered in my research this week, the Hebrew word for Satan means to attack or accuse an adversary or to resist. And it was actually just a regular old Hebrew word that meant those things long before it was used in scripture as a name. So basically, Satan, his name became synonymous with his character, kind of like love and chocolate. They're basically the same thing, right? Right? Unless it's Hershey's. Don't give me Hershey's. <laughs> okay, it's got to be Belgian or Swiss, you know, that good stuff. So he has a reputation for being an accuser. It became his name. He delights in pointing out our weaknesses in order to tear us down, cause us to feel shame, um, regret, unworthiness. What are some of the accusations we hear as moms? You're such a hypocrite. You're trying to chain your children to do things that you haven't even mastered yet. You're a fraud. You have no idea what you're doing. Yep. <laughs> but it hurts, doesn't it? It hits us. Let's, let's contrast this with the advocate. He chooses. In our text... The Lord says, I reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Why was God saying that? And what, um, why was that cause for him to rebuke Satan? I believe it's because God was reminding Satan that he is consistent. If he was the God that had chosen Jerusalem and continued to choose Jerusalem, despite the Israelites constantly walking away from him, then he was the God that was still going to choose Joshua. It didn't matter that he was filthy. It didn't matter. It didn't disqualify him. 1 Corinthians 1 verses, uh, verse 27 says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Moms, do you ever feel foolish? I have no idea what I'm doing. Do you ever feel weak? I mean, I always have a glorious night's sleep. I wake up refreshed and energized for the day ahead. No, I'm kidding. No, motherhood is intense. You know, I, I constantly battle tiredness, weakness, a sense of helplessness, inadequacy. Yet God chose us to be a mother, no matter how ill-equipped or unqualified we may feel. Let's look at point two for the adversary. The adversary invades. The meaning of invade, one meaning I looked up, said to go in with hostile intent. Very clear from our text in Zechariah. He comes into the very holy presence of God himself. He's invading a holy place, evil personified. How dare he? But he invades with the evil intent of tearing us down and telling us that we have no business being there. Um, where is it here? Filthy clothes. Um, Joshua is wearing these filthy clothes, representative of sin. You can't be in the presence of God. You've done this and that. You're unqualified. Accusation, accusation. But the advocate sees those very clothes, sees that sin, and he doesn't disqualify us. He invites us. No, hold on. We're, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. We are in the Sorry, we are in the adversary invades. Skipping ahead a little bit. He invades the presence of God. How does he invade? He invades our minds by taking a nugget of truth and perverting it. John 8, 44, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
So, for example, let's say hypothetically I'm having a rough day. Sometimes it happens. You know, thing after thing's going wrong. I end up in my bedroom at the end of the night looking at myself in the mirror, and lo and behold, there's stains all over my clothes. Okay? There's pasta sauce, markers, poop, boogers, whatever. You name it. The evidence is there. All right? And there's that nugget of truth that the enemy takes, but he works it in your mind. And sure enough, I'm standing there saying, oh, man, my clothes are a filthy mess. The longer I look there, I'm looking, yeah, is that a wrinkle? Look at those gray hairs. Oh, I might as well have a wart on the end of my nose and a hair growing out of it. I'm so unattractive. Who would ever want to be near me? Okay, that's a bit extreme, but we women have a tendency to get carried away with ourselves, don't we? Husbands, have you ever stood by and watched in bewilderment as your wife goes from zero to 60 in three seconds flat? And you're thinking, what just happened? Enemy invasion. He's strategically placed these rabbit trails for, to divert our attention, to get us looking on, at ourselves, getting us to feel down on ourselves. 90% of the time, that's what it is. Enemy invasion. The other 10% is sleep deprivation or lack of chocolate. But you see the progression. It started as, look at my filthy clothes. I'm a filthy mess. My clothes are a filthy mess. And then it turns into, I'm a filthy mess. I'm worthless. I'm, you fill in the blank. So onto the advocate invites. Sorry, we had a sneak preview of that before. The advocate invites. What a contrast. He sees the same filthy clothing but he doesn't use that to disqualify us. He takes them off. He gives us a new wardrobe. Who doesn't like a new wardrobe, right? And these clothes that he gives us are not off the rack. They are custom made. They fit every curve, every wrinkle, every lump and bump and whatever. He doesn't disqualify us from his presence. Psalm 103 says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. And Hebrews 4, he understands our weaknesses. He faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. That, my friends, is the invitation of our advocate. The final trait of our adversary is that he devalues like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. He sees no value in a half-burned log. In fact, he'll throw dirt on it and finish the job, snuff it out, squish it. It's as good as dead. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's a strong word. John 10.10 10 says, The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy He's not messing around. This is not a game for him. He is very strategic. He wants to tear down the impact of our motherhood. He devalues your role as mother. He devalues your children. He devalues the impact you have on your children. And there's your motivational thought for the morning. Happy Mother's Day. No, it is not the end of the story. We have one more. Hang in with me. Final trait. The advocate delights. This is my favorite. Remember the burning stick that we were just talking about. Isaiah 42 verse 3 says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. The Lord is compassionate. He rescues those who are hanging by a thread. Do you ever feel like that some days? Just hanging by a thread. Why does he do this? Because he delights in us. Let me give you an example from music. I'm a musician, so I thought this was appropriate. Have you heard of the um, violin maker called Antonio Stradivari? He, made, um, he had a very unique way in which he crafted his stringed instruments, and they had a, a very unique sound to them that was sought after. He was in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. So much so that um, at auctions, Still today, these stringed instruments will fetch millions of dollars. And you will find that a damaged or even broken Stradivarius will sell for more than your average student model, no-name 
violin. Why? Because it holds intrinsic value because of who made it. It holds intrinsic value because of who made it. I was having a conversation with the Lord a few weeks ago. He had his finger on a part of my life that he was just wanting to work on and saying, Carol, I need you to strengthen this area. I want you to grow. And I worked on it for a bit, but it was hard. And I got lazy. And I, the enemy got to me, and I was feeling guilty. I came into my quiet time with the Lord and just feeling really down on myself. God, I'm sorry, and I know I need to work on this. And, and I was overwhelmed by the fact that he just welcomed me. He met with me anyway. He didn't disqualify me. He wanted to meet with me. He wasn't irritated with me. He just said, okay, let's pick up. Let's start again. Let's keep going. And what he said to me was so beautiful, I wrote it down because I knew I'm going to have to go back to this and remember this. I wanted to read it to you because it really illustrates this point. Carolyn, I know you by name. I formed you, crafted you. From nothing, I made something beautiful. Why would I not want to commune with you? You are precious to me. You have priceless value. You're not like some childish craft that after a while gets tossed to the side. You are a masterpiece. Everything I make is a masterpiece and holds intrinsic value. Remember this. Nothing can change that. Your value is not in how you look or how you perform. It has everything to do with who made you. And Isaiah 62 verse 4 says, The Lord delights in you. Zephaniah 3.17, He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. So as I finish here, I ask, how can we discern whether we're listening to the adversary or to the advocate? For me, it helps me to think, how is this making me feel? When a weakness is uncovered, when a sin is brought to, to the surface, am I being made to feel guilty, ashamed, condemned? That's the adversary. On the other hand, the advocate, the Bible says his kindness leads us to repentance. He says, Carolyn, I see this in you. Let's work on it. It's holding you back. I want to take you over here. This is a better place. I have more in mind for you. He always comes with hope and a future, not hopelessness. Pay attention to how you're feeling and make sure that you're listening to the right voice. So what does God see when he looks at me? Beyond the scars, the brokenness, the weaknesses, he sees value, he sees worth, he sees beauty. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that we have heard from your word this morning. Lord, seal your word in our hearts. Cause it to bring it back to memory as we go through our week. Remind us of your amazing love, your amazing grace that you extend to us time and time again. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, now I'd like to invite Anne to have her turn. Good morning. I see many friends. And I see many yet to be friends. How wonderful. I want to begin with two verses from Isaiah 55. Thanks, Kathy. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word. It goes out from my mouth. It does not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Yay for the rain. Today, we're going to look at several Bible verses. And having just heard this promise from Isaiah 55, we'll expect that each of us will... These verses that come to land in our hearts, the Lord is going to accomplish what he desires in those verses, so we can expect 
fruitfulness in our hearts today. Our Mother's Day topic from me is beauty. And not just beauty, it's our own beauty, God-given, unique for each one of us. We will explore how to nurture and to protect this beauty. We're looking in the New Testament in a chapter maybe you never thought as a beautiful chapter or a chapter about beauty. It's John chapter 14. What happened in the previous chapter? In 13, it's the night before Jesus was to be crucified. He had the Passover meal with his, his men. He washed their feet and said, you do, you do likewise. Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, and Jesus told him, what you got to do, do quickly. And Judas Iscariot left. And Peter, he swore that he would stand by his master. But Jesus says, no, Peter, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. All of that happened in 13. And now Jesus is talking at the start of John 14. Do you know what he says? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. What a wonderful beginning. I believe these two sentences contain a great treasure. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Now, when I'm troubled, I sometimes check it out. It's scary because there's tension in my face. What was a wrinkle here is now a, a, a deep etched ravine. <laughs> my eyes are troubled. Is there a smile? No trace. So it's not a good picture. And yet, Jesus' command is strong. Do not let your hearts be troubled. If your heart is troubled, your face will be troubled. But if your heart is peaceful, guess what? Your face will show it. This indicates we have a choice. If our hearts are going to be serene like a lake, a quiet lake, or stirred up like a sea that's getting whipped by the wind, which one do you choose? There's quite a theme of peace in John 14. And the more peaceful we are, the more we reflect Jesus. This is a good thing. The more we reflect Jesus, the more lovely we are. Now, here's some verses a bit later, starting with verse 15 of the same chapter. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. We can call him the advocate. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you. He will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my father. And you are in me. And I am in you. Now, this is truth is so important to me that I'm going to try to act it out. Whoops. Jesus is saying, is it still on? Oh, good. Okay. Jesus is saying, you are in me and I am in you. Now, this bag represents Jesus. You say, what color is it? It's red because of the blood that he shed. Why did he shed the blood? It was for our cleansing. Now this, what color is this? This is white because his blood washed me clean. And I am no longer carrying my sin. And so he was saying, you are in me. Now this, can you see the white bag at all? It's really conceited. It's all the way in there, isn't it? It says in Colossians, and we're hidden in him. This was a big help to me on the other day. I was trying to drive into the north suburbs, didn't just know what I was doing. And I remembered the red bag. And as the GPS was trying to tell me about the exit and the trucks, I thought of this. And it was a comfort. But not only that, Jesus says in John 14 that I am in you. Now, how can that be? One way it can be is... Are his words in us? Yeah. If our words, yeah, if they're in us. And then he says, and I am in the Father. 
Everybody's together. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Yay. Now, you might think happily ever after. And yet, look at the world. Is it a happily ever after? No, Tony, it's not. No, no. It's full of trouble and strife and I'm afraid fear and pain and suspicion and a lot of bad things. Now, this we trace back to the enemy. Carolyn called the enemy adversary, fallen angel, proud, took one-third of the angels with him. And he has a major attack on women. Did you know that, ladies? He hates us. He has a set of lies he frequently uses with women. He deceives us by telling us that we don't make the grade. He lies to us, saying that we're inferior, not wanted, not valuable, that we should be discarded. He insists that we're not pretty, not acceptable, not the right weight, the hair is wrong, we're not worth keeping. He uses sometimes the media, advertising, lots of movies to show us that if we're not a certain shape, if we're not a certain age, we don't count. Can you feel the sagging? If we believe him, our faces and our postures will start sagging. But, and if we believe him, he'll try some more. He'll hit us harder. We could stumble and shrink and forget the truth. The truth is that we are beautiful. Yes, you believe it, don't you? Some of you do. Fearfully and wonderfully made, as it says in Psalm 139. Now, let me shift gears for a minute, tell you a little about myself. My name is Anne Elizabeth Campbell. I was born physically in 1947. I was born spiritually in 1973, in February, February 20th, in a dorm room of Burge Hall at the University of Iowa campus in Iowa City. I was born again. I received Christ as my Savior. It was glorious. I'm the mother of five, Heather, Aaron, Mary, who's with us today, yay, Ruth and William. I love being a mom. The father of all these children, he's been in heaven since 2018, going on four years. But before he left, he logged hundreds of hours of praying for our children. You know what? These prayers have not expired. I'm a grandma of five. Two of them are in the nursery right now. And they are Jack and Owen and Maeve and Joel and Molly. I love being a grandma. <coughs> Excuse me. This battle between the truth of God's love and the constant barrage of lies is very real to me. I take this battle seriously. And some of you might look at me and say, yes, you're a nice little old lady. You probably had a nice little childhood in your Christian home. Uh-uh, no. I grew up in a fair war zone, like some of you did. And there was alcoholism and abuse. There was atheism and Freemasonry. That'll be enough of the list. But you might say, was anything good? Yes, yes. When I was five, our dog had her puppies on my bed. That was a great thing. And my dad's dad was a farmer, a dairy farmer. He had a barn, two barns. And I love those cows. I love those barn cats. I love playing in the bales of hay. And I love the collie dog. So there were good things. And yet, in general, the house I grew up in was fairly hostile, confusing. And there was a lot of landing strips for the devil because the devil will take advantage of anything. Any brokenness. Right, Carolyn? He does. Now, until he'll, he'll do that. He'll just wreak, wreak wreckage until we stop him. You say, can we stop him? Yes, we can stop him. Jesus wants us to stop him. He wants us to stop the devil from taking apart our lives. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That is Jesus' very strong assignment of authority. Now, if we could have on the screen this very important verse from 2 Corinthians, please. It's 
It's how we learn to detect Satan's strongholds and dismantle them. This is very encouraging. Well, you might say, why, why are you talking about battle on Mother's Day? Hey, if we're going to be good moms, effective moms of adult children, we're going to do battle for them. This is part of the, the clue. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have what kind of power? Divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Really? Can we do that? Well, yeah. We need to detect and replace Satan's lies. And this, this is a very critical spiritual warfare tactic about taking everything captive. Now, I'm going to go to the world of football for a minute. Do I understand it much? No. But I know that some here in this house do. And so what is it that's happening on that field? If you had 11 guys lined up with the pigskin, and every few minutes they moved 10 yards this way, and then they kept moving 10 yards this way, and then how would you pay money to watch a game like that? No, there's got to be opposition, right? You need two teams. And one wants the first down, and the other is going to do anything they can to keep. So what are we taking captive? I think we're trying to take captive the first down. Or is it the ball? Or is it the touch? Hey, but it, it gives us a thought of the opposition. And I want you to know, every morning when you get up, the game is on, and Satan is going to try to grab that ball off your thoughts and take it into the gutter. Take it to dismay. Take it to despair. Take it to suspicion. Take it to blame. Take it negative. The game is on, and it's just like those guys. Is that called the line of scrimmage, where they're like, they're getting ready for the play? How many of those guys on the line of scrimmage are thinking about what's going to be for supper? No, no. They're probably not figuring out, are they going to pay the auto insurance or are they going to pay the... Don't you think on the line of scrimmage they're totally focused? Okay, focused. Like only men can be focused. When we get up in the morning, we have the same opportunity. Focus on what? On Jesus. How can we do that? Well, we keep his thoughts in our mind. Now, that, that was the football idea. We've got something more here. This is Mother's Day, and this is a beauty kit. You say, Anne, why do you have such a giant beauty kit? Some of us need a lot of help. <laughs> it's true. Now, um, because I used to have acne, ha-ha, I'm going to take every blemish captive. This is my concealer. Some days, I take every eyelash captive. Shh. Some days, it's every hair. And I make curls out of it. But this is my efforts to get to win at the beauty game, right? Oh, this next one's a little tougher. How do I take every pound captive? All right, but the last one is the most important. It's the most important. How do I take every thought captive? Yeah, what is it? It's the Bible. This is the B-I-B-L-E. This is how I know what to do with my thoughts. Because right from the get-go in the morning, Satan is trying to grab them and say, remember that time when you goofed up? Hey, Mm -mm. We're not going to go there. We don't need to go to the shame places. We can go to the heavenly place. Are we seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms? Go there. Go there. So, the more we read our Bible and absorb what we're reading, the more able we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, if a thought comes into your mind and it's obviously not of God, it would nowhere be in this book. What do you do about it? 
we do what Jesus did. Remember? In the wilderness? Satan was saying, all right, turn those stones into bread. And what did Jesus say? It is written. What was he doing? He was quoting Deuteronomy because he had memorized it. It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, all right. Now, here's another example. You're at Woodman's. You're in the produce department. You notice there's a cart there. Nobody's with it. There's a bunch, there's a watermelon, there's celery, but there's a purse in there. The purse is, there's a wallet at the top of the purse, and Satan is saying, your electric bill is overdue. You don't have enough to, nobody's watching. You just take it. Uh-oh. Moment of decision. What do we say? We say, it is written, you shall not steal. Away from me, Satan. Just turn from it. It, it helps to have some verses memorized. Now, here's another example, <clears throat> especially for ladies. It's Sunday morning. Perhaps you didn't sleep well. Maybe kids were up in the night. There's dark circles on your eyes. They're darker than usual, and nothing you're trying on is fitting. It's all piled on the bed. And there comes a voice. <clears throat> Maybe you should just stay home from church today. You're tired. You look wiped out. No one is going to miss you anyway. Ha ha. Would you recognize that as the voice of the enemy? Okay. And then you're not going to stay quiet because he's trying to pick a fight with you. He's trying to influence you. He's trying to get you to give up from going to church. You might say this, get behind me, Satan. It's written, let us not give up meeting together. Someone will surely need my encouragement. It's not all about me. Hey, then we've canceled the lie. This is good. This is like the first down. Is it important? Like a first... Folks, this is as important as a first down in a big game. We've acknowledged that there will be someone at church who needs our encouragement. Are there always people here who need a smile? Yes. They need to talk. They need to say, hey... There are always people here. Now, here's a fun alternative to despair when you're in your bathroom. It's something I do. Ask God to send some Esther angels to your bathroom to help you get ready. You might say, who are they? I figure angels were there thousands of years ago helping Esther in the capital at Susa. They were helping her with, to be beautiful for the king. I've asked those same angels to come and help me. Angels don't die. And there's more than one angel that's really good at beautifying. And so I invite them in. You'd be amazed by how much better your bathroom looks when you get the demons out and you invite the angels in. The whole place shines. Before I close, I want to leave you with a few beautiful portions of truth that you'll want to keep in your beauty kit. Now, I hope there's still some of these out on the tables. We've made up a few of these papers with scripture on them. Because scripture is an important part of the beauty kit. And here's one that I'm going to ask to come up on the screen now. There it is. It's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always. Hey, how about just now and then? No. Always. We do much better if we just do it steadily. Rejoicing. Is it possible? Yes. It does wonders for your face. Instead of the wrinkles, you turn up. Yeah. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. That means just talk to God all the day. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He has a will. He knows the battle is fierce. This is one. This is a very excellent one to just keep in your purse, on the fridge, wherever. Keep it so you just, am I doing those things? Rejoice. There's even a song that goes with it. Perhaps some of you will remember. What we soak in, look at, listen to, absorb will make a difference. Psalm 1-3 describes what happens when we meditate on God's word. We'll be like a tree planted by what? Water. We'll bear fruit in season. Our leaves, what will happen? Are, they will not wither. This is withering. This is not withering. Enough of us are withering as it is. We don't want any more withering. 
we want to thrive. And this, Psalm 1, verse 3, is a divine recipe for flourishing. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, like it says in Hebrews 12, then we'll be full of the beauty of our Lord, and his beauty will radiate out of us. My own mirror has taught me this truth. Jesus, beautiful Savior, is the source of our true beauty, our eternal and everlasting beauty. Don't you want something that lasts? Yeah. When he can be seen shining out of our faces, we are radiantly beautiful, right? Yes. Will Satan try to obscure Jesus? You betcha. He will. We learn how to silence him. We silence him. We keep shining for Jesus. Our unfading beauty, the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, like it says in 1 Peter 3, is a glorious gift Jesus gives to us. And we can be delighted in giving it back to him. Thank you for listening. Well, now I get to be in my comfy place. I'm going to sing a song for you. This song um, just kind of sums up all the thoughts that we've been sharing this morning. I pray it's a blessing for you. in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up Am I more than just the sum of every high
and received just some rich truth today that reminds us of really things that are related to our identity in Christ and how our adversary wars against us walking in that identity and believing that identity. And I want you to just kind of humble yourself before God right now and maybe just bow your heads in prayer. Because I'm wondering if you're here today and you say, you know what, I've been listening to the adversary more than I've been listening to the advocate. And today the Lord is just wanting to shift your heart. He's, he's wanting your ears to be tuned in to, to his voice more than those other ones that are common to you. And if you're here today and you just say, I need to tune my ear towards the advocate. Would you just raise your hand? We want to pray for you. Okay. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's hands everywhere today. This is a battle that we all fight. And Lord, I thank you for the women and the men that are raising their hands right now and just saying, Lord, would you just kind of dial me in to you more than I have been? And Father, I pray right now that those things that have been common to us that are from the adversary, Lord, may they be laid down right now. May they be turned over to you because your invitation is this, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And, and right now, if you have that something specific that, that the Lord is just kind of impressing upon you, that, that this needs to be addressed, this needs to be laid down, I, I want you to do that right now in prayer and just say, Lord, I give that thing to you. And Father, I just pray right now that there would be a liberty and a freedom flowing in this house because hearts are being un tied from things that they do not need to be attached to. So Lord, you and you alone have the power and the authority to do this. And we invite you and we welcome you and we ask you to help us as we turn to you. And Lord, I thank you that in you we are not lost, but we are found. We are not weak, but we are strong. We are not forsaken. We are loved. We are not orphans. We are your children. And Lord, I thank you most of all that as your children, you are our Lord. And that there is power in your name. Because your name is above every name. And you have won the victory. So Lord, I just pray now that you'd begin to speak over us. You begin to, to fill those places that we've just emptied with the truth of your word and of who we are in you. And Lord, may it be something that doesn't just 
um, happen in this moment, Lord, but may it be something that multiplies throughout the day and into the new week, Lord. Speak to us. Open our eyes. Help us to draw close to you and to know your heart. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you are doing. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just here today, and I want to ask you who your life belongs to. If you're here today and you say, I have never given my life to the advocate, I've never given my life to Christ and made him my Lord, today is the day where you can come to know him. You know, you're, you're saying, I've walked with the adversary for long enough. I've, 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 I've listened to his voice for long enough. I've allowed him to rule my life and to lead me long enough. And today I say no more. But I want to know Christ, his forgiveness, and his power to give me new life. If you're here today and that's you, you say, I want to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. Would you just raise a hand? We want to pray a prayer with you. It's just a simple prayer of faith that begins a journey with him. I'm going to give a moment just for you to process what the Lord's doing today. And anyone at all, it just says, today's the day I put my life in his hands. So Father, we thank you for your free gift of salvation. And that your invitation, Lord, is to follow you and to know you. Now, Lord, I just pray now for all of us in this room. May that be our reality and may it be that which defines us. I pray as we go today, Lord, may we go in your grace and in your peace. I pray that you would watch over us and keep us. I pray, Lord, for your favor to be upon us. And may you bring us back again soon and safely. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our live stream today. Our hope is that you will discover life in Christ. If you have a prayer need, please take time to fill out a connection card from our website, or you may also send an email to prayer at rockchurch.net, and one of our pastors will follow up with you as soon as possible. For more information about our church, please visit our website at rockchurch.net. We hope to see you in person for one of our live services on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. God bless you today.